Stock Market Investing for Beginners and Dummies. Author, Giovanni Richters. Narrator, Ron Garner. Introduction. It's time to get serious about your financial life and start thinking about the future. No one can and should work their whole life. You still want to enjoy life, spend quality time with your family, and your body won't let you work forever. Also, nowadays you cannot rely on a pension like in the good old days. So, it's up to you and no one else to take the steps toward building your wealth. The process is not hard, but you will have to pay attention and spend some time learning about investing. There is no way around it. There are many ways you can invest, and there are many different investment accounts on the market, but it is not too hard or complicated to weed through the investment jungle. It's also highly likely that you will start enjoying it and take it to the next level by investing in individual companies. First, we will have to start with the basics of what stocks are and what the stock market is. We'll delve into how to make money and what to do if there is a market crash. Then, we'll look at some common misconceptions and mistakes people make in the stock market. So, follow along with me as we traverse this jungle on our way to paradise. Chapter 1. What are stocks? The easiest way to get rich. A stock is simply a piece of a company. A stock represents ownership and is an asset you can buy. The people who own these stocks are called shareholders. Let's look at an example. If you and your family are going to eat a pie or pizza that has eight slices, then everyone would get at least one piece or slice. Out of the eight slices, you get only one and your dad gets two. You got one eighth or 12.5% of the pizza, and your dad got two eighths, or 25%. Companies work the same way, but instead of eight shares of stock, they could have shares of stock in the millions or even billions. McDonald's has 797 million shares outstanding. Walmart has 2.9 billion, and Facebook has 2.3 billion shares outstanding. Shares outstanding is a term used to explain the total amount of company shares on the stock market for shareholders to buy and sell amongst themselves. Shareholders can be people or different types of institutions. Also, you are not limited by geography when investing because you can buy stocks from companies around the world. So if you want to buy stocks from companies in the Netherlands or even Brazil, you can. One thing you need to pay attention to is that there are two types of stocks on the market, growth stocks and income stocks. Companies that see their stock price rise up fast, like technology companies, are growth stocks. For example, Facebook and Twitter. These are rapidly growing companies and any income they make is put back in the company for further growth and expansion. Income stocks, my favorite, are stocks that periodically pay their shareholders a dividend. This is usually quarterly, but it could also be monthly, semi-annually, or annually. The companies who can afford to pay their shareholders income are large, well-established companies, like Procter & Gamble or the Pepsi Company. There are benefits to owning both growth and income stocks. Growth stocks have the potential to increase in value fast, but they are also more volatile and risky. Income stocks, on the other hand, provide a consistent stream of dividend income, but the stock itself might not appreciate in value as fast as a growth stock. For these two types of stocks, there are also two different types of investors, growth investors and value investors. Growth investors love it when they see their stock price increase in value, also called a capital gain. They are also more willing to take on a greater risk for even greater reward. Value investors like analyzing a company's metrics and numbers and are willing to wait until it's the right time to buy shares in a company. Value investors are good at discovering great companies who are consistent performers and are likely to stay consistent in the future based on the product or services they sell in the market they are in. You might be thinking that to start buying stocks, 
you need to have a ton of money or be a millionaire. That's not true at all. You can start by just buying one share in a company. While I'm writing this, I saw that the Nike stock is being sold for $60, Coca-Cola for $46, and Twitter for $21. Now, this is not an endorsement to buy these three stocks. It's just an example that you don't have to spend thousands to get going. Now, with the boring definition complete, let's look at how people get rich with stocks. The four main ways people can get rich are capital gains, dividends, selling short, options trading. The last two require a bit of skill and work, and they are not as passive as the first two. Capital gains are when your stocks gain in value. The beauty of this is that you do not perform any physical labor. It's all passive. Let's say you bought 10 shares of the $46 Coca-Cola stock on Tuesday. So your stocks are worth $460. On Friday, the stocks went up to $52. Your stocks, capital, just increased. Gain. Your investment is now worth $520. So your capital increased by $60. Now if you own 100 or even 1,000 shares, that $6 increase would look even better. With dividends, you get rich by constantly buying dividend-paying stocks, reinvesting those dividends, and you also enjoy the dividend increases from the company themselves. With dividends, it's more of a snowball effect. In the beginning, your income is low, but after time, it exponentially increases, allowing you to live off your dividend income without you ever having to sell your stocks. Investing to get rich and wealthy should be your long-term goal. Chapter 2 what is the stock market? The stock market is like any other market where buyers and sellers come together to trade in goods or services. Think about the car market. You're the buyer who's interested in buying a new red car. You will head over to the car dealership where you are met by eager salesmen. They show you the latest car models and after some back and forth, they convince you to put down some money in exchange for a new car. The stock market or stock exchange, works the same way. But instead of the car being the product, it shares a stock. The two most well-known stock exchanges in North America are the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. It's on these stock markets that you can buy shares in companies like Snapchat, Apple, and Starbucks. One of the main difference between the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ is that the New York Stock Exchange offers traditional trading, and the NASDAQ is totally electronic. Traditional trading is face-to-face -face trading where buyers and sellers of stocks are on the trading floor executing orders. On the NASDAQ, all orders happen electronically through computers and telephones. Many small and up-and-coming companies can be traded over the counter, or OTC. This is where investors can buy and sell penny stocks. In the past, the stock markets were only available to the rich and wealthy among us. But ever since the doors were open to the common folk, it has been one of the main vehicles in producing wealth. There have been many times in history where the market crashed and people ended up losing all or most of their money. A stock market crash strikes fear in the hearts of many stockholders because many shareholders have their retirement and wealth invested in the stock market. Why does the market go up and down and crash every couple of years? For an explanation, we have to look at both the short-term and long-term. Short-term market fluctuations could be triggered by anything, like shareholder speculation, bad news about a sector, changes in governmental policies, companies meeting or exceeding their projected goals, and the list goes on. I remember back in 2006 or 2007, there was a popular fast food restaurant in New York that was forced to shut down because the place had a rat infestation problem. Even after it was closed, you can see the giant New York City rats running back and forth inside the restaurant. Bad news like this made shareholders freak out and the company saw a decline in their share price. After some time passed, the price of the stock climbed back up. You probably know which restaurant I'm talking about, but if you don't, just do a quick search online. Better yet, use YouTube.
Fluctuations in the stock market are influenced by the market cycle we are in. During times of prosperity, the stock market is in a bull market, meaning an upward trend. In times of economic hardship and uncertainty, the stock market tends to be in a bear market, which is a downward trend. Besides buying stocks, you can also buy mutual funds, bonds, futures, options, commodities, index funds, and ETFs on the market. Companies on the stock market are all publicly traded companies. This means that these companies need to be transparent with their shareholders about their business activities. They also need to present quarterly reports called 10Qs and yearly reports called the 10Ks, along with an annual report. In order to get listed on the stock exchange, a private company on the primary market goes public through an initial public offering allowing its shares to be bought and sold on the secondary market, which is the market regular investors like you and me have access to. A company only makes money during the IPO by selling its shares to the public. It's then in the hands of the shareholders who can trade with each other. Of course, a company keeps being the owner of a majority of their shares and they can buy back shares if it makes financial or business sense. With all the different risk involved in the stock market, many people still invest in it because long-term, it has proven to be a great wealth builder. Chapter 3. How to Buy Stocks Before you jump in to buy one share of stock or multiple stocks, you need to have a goal you want to reach. Are you investing for retirement? Do you want to buy stocks because you think you can make money fast? Or perhaps you want to get your feet wet and just gain some experience. Answering the thoughtful question, what your goal is, will determine what type of investor you will be, how much money you will need, and how long you should hold on to the stocks you are planning on buying. Answering this question will also determine if you are a short-term or long-term investor. Short-term investors like to buy and sell frequently within the same day or within a couple of weeks. These traders are called day traders and swing traders. These traders try to make money fast by buying low and selling high or short selling. They are in their trading accounts every single day. The stock market is open, looking for opportunities to make a profit. Long-term investors take a different approach. They still keep an eye on how their stocks are performing, but they take the long-term approach of buying stocks to hold for 5, 10, or many more years. If you invest for retirement, you would take the long-term approach. You should also ask yourself how much risk you are willing to take on if you buy stocks. The stock market can be very volatile, and you could lose a ton of money if you are not careful. If you are a young investor who has some money to play around with and don't mind the short-term up and down swings on the market, then you can take on a good deal of risk. But if you are close to retirement and want to preserve and grow your money, then you should be more cautious about investing and buying stocks. It's also a good idea to talk to a financial advisor or a financial planner. In order to start investing, you need an investment account. This account gives you access to buy and sell equities, also called stocks. There are many types of accounts on the market, but the more prominent ones are the 401k, IRA, Roth IRA, traditional brokerage account, the 403b, and the education savings account, also called ESA. The 401k and 403b are available only through your employer if they decide to enroll in these accounts. Companies also offer a certain match percentage or dollar amount in order to motivate their employees to participate in the plans. There is a limit, however, to how much you can contribute to a 401k or 403b. The IRA, which stands for Individual Retirement Account, and the Roth IRA are both retirement accounts you can set up with an investment firm, bank, or credit union. Three differences between the IRA and 401k are the limit amounts, company match, and selection of investment options. IRAs and Roth IRAs always have a lower limit 
compared to the 401k. IRAs also do not offer a company contribution match. Where IRAs and Roth IRAs do stand out is in allowing you to invest in whatever you like. Investing through a 401k is always limited by what the company has chosen for their employees, which are target date retirement funds, a limited selection of mutual funds and index funds, and no individual stocks to select from, unless the company allows you to purchase some of its own stock. Also, you don't have to choose between setting up a 401k or IRA because you are allowed to have both. 401k and IRAs penalize you if you withdraw your money before you are 59 and a half. You get hit with the 10% penalty and you are more than likely also going to pay taxes. This is where the traditional brokerage accounts step in. The brokerage account allows you to withdraw your money anytime, but you will, however, pay taxes on your capital gains and dividends, but you won't get hit with a 10% penalty. With all the different types of accounts on the market, it might be hard to choose one to get started. So let me tell you what I've done. First, I enrolled in the 401k and got my company match. I then opened a Roth IRA with a discount broker and then I open a traditional brokerage account. Don't forget, you are not limited by the amount of investment accounts you can have. Some of the top brokerage firms are Ally, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade. Opening an account is also really easy. Just head over to the investment website and click on the Open Account button. Or you can also call them and they will eagerly help you in opening your account. In order to buy stocks, you need to know the ticker symbol of the company you want to buy stock in. The ticker symbol is the unique abbreviation of the company on the stock market. For example, the Pepsi company is found under the ticker symbol PEP, Amazon is AMZN, and Walt Disney is DIS. Once you know the ticker symbol, you are ready to find out what the price of a share is and how many you want to buy. Head over to your brokerage account and log in. Navigate to your trading option and type in the amount of shares you want to buy. In my example below, we are looking to buy five Coca-Cola stocks. Now you have to choose your order type. Let's go ahead and choose the market order, which means we'll buy the stock at whatever price it is on a market currently. You then preview your order where you can see what you're buying how many shares, what your commission is, meaning your trading fee, and your order total. Hit place order, and if you're trading during the regular hours, which is Monday through Friday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, your order will execute immediately and your trading account will update with the stocks you just bought. So this is a fairly easy process. However, the important thing is to buy stocks at the right time by looking at both the technical and fundamental analysis of a company. Chapter 4. The Stock Market Will Crash. Here's what you should do. A stock market crash occurs when there is a dramatic and swift decline in stock prices across many sectors or industries. This decline happens quickly in just a few days or can take some time to hit the bottom, so to say. This drop is so significant that the stock markets end up closing early in order to prevent the stock prices from declining even further. A stock market correction should not be confused with a crash. A correction takes place when the market has been overvalued and needs to be adjusted by coming down to its respective valuation. Market corrections happen often and usually don't last very long because when they have been readjusted, it's back to business as usual. A crash, however, is when all hell breaks loose and the sky is falling. You'll hear newscasters preaching the end of the world, and you'll see politicians blame one another's policies that led to the crash. A stock market crash can be influenced by many events, like an economic depression or recession, instability in countries, and stockholders' speculations bidding up shares so much that they form stock market bubbles. This is purely emotional and all logic is out of the window. 
the bubble always ends up bursting and shareholders start selling in panic. When this happens, you need to stay calm, of course. If you panic, you will make mistakes. The first thing to remember is that we've had crashes before in the past. Each one has always been different, but we've been able to bounce back. If you are a short-term investor, then this is the right time to start short selling, which is the act of borrowing shares, selling them at the higher market price, then buying them back at a lower market price, and finally returning those borrowed shares, the difference is your profit. If you're retired or close to retirement, your money needs to be in a safer fixed income assets, so you should not feel too much of the sting. I'm talking about assets like bonds, cash, money market accounts, savings accounts, and annuities. Only a small percentage needs to be in stocks. If you are a long-term investor, continue to stick to your investing strategy of consistently buying investments weekly, bi-weekly, or even monthly. What you are doing is called dollar cost averaging. This is when you invest a fixed dollar amount periodically to buy investments. If you are investing through your employer in the 401k, then you are already participating in dollar cost averaging because money that is taken out of your check is invested on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis, no matter what is happening in the market. The benefit of this is that it takes out your emotions because your money is invested during the good times and the bad. So you're buying investments when they are both expensive and cheap, which averages you out. The biggest advantage to invest during a market crash is that you can buy stocks really cheap. It's like going through your local store and you see everything is on sale for at least 40% off. So those new black shoes you wanted are now 60% off. The new MacBook you're looking to buy, 50% off. I know most people don't have the stomach to buy during a crash. This is when dollar cost averaging is your much needed friend. Allowing you to buy equities while they are cheap also boosts your compound interest, which is the interest you received on your original investment amount, which is compounded with the latest interest just received. So in other words, you are making interest on your interest. While everyone around you is panic selling at a loss and losing their investments, you're calmly buying more assets through dollar cost averaging and undervalued individual stocks at an affordable price and holding on to them for the long term. On a side note, make sure you hold on to your dividend paying stocks because these companies are mostly well-established market leaders. When there is a crash, they tend to bounce back quicker compared to non-dividend paying stocks like most tech companies. The dividend you received from these companies also acts like a cushion to lessen the blow from the crash. Companies like McDonald's, Pepsi, and Nike continue to pay dividends even during the housing crash of 2008 to 2009. Let's look at two examples of stock market crashes. The first example is the crash of 1929 that led to the Great Depression. Different bankers, investment firms, and traders participated in manipulating the markets by buying large chunks of highly overvalued stocks then selling these to unsuspected retail investors, investors like you and me. Because these businesses bought a large number of shares, they were constantly pushing up the share prices. Individual investors saw their share prices skyrocket and kept purchasing more because there was no limit, they thought. They even opened margin accounts, letting them invest with borrowed money offered by their brokerage firms. Most institutional investors did reap their rewards and jumped out of the market, leaving the individual investors with overpriced stocks. When the decline happened, everything went fast. Not only did people lose money because they got hit with the margin call to return the money they borrowed, they also lost their jobs, their retirement wealth, which was, of course, invested in the stock market, and many people lost their minds. The second crash we will take a look at is the dot-com crash of the early 2000s. The dot-com bubble was based purely on speculation. The internet was that new shiny object everybody wanted a piece of. Everybody and their grandma tried setting up a website, then traded it on the secondary market through an IPO. 
Many of these companies could never make a profit or were mostly in the red, but people did not care. Websites were evaluated by how many clicks they received or how many eyeballs they could generate instead of using traditional valuation methods like revenue and expenses. At the height of the bubble, everything came tumbling down like a house of cards. Many startup companies received millions in venture capital funds with the impossible task to get just as big, if not bigger, than the tech giants of those days, like Microsoft, Apple, and Oracle. Chapter 5. How to Make Money in the Stock Market So you want to make easy money in the stock market, but don't know where to start, how to take action, or you're trying to figure out how other successful investors are making money. We'll look at the two easiest ways investors have been able to get rich by investing in the stock market. Best of all, you can do it also. The two common ways investors make money in the stock market are with capital gains and dividends. Capital gains explain. When you have your money invested in the stock market, the value of this asset goes up and down. When your money, also called your capital, increases in value, you have just received a capital gain. And when it decreases in value, it's called, you guessed it, a capital loss. As long as your money is invested in the stock market, it's unrealized. It only becomes realized once you sell your stocks. Let's look at an example. You decide to buy 100 Nike shares at around $65. Without factoring in trading fees, you ended up buying $6,500. This is also what your Nike stock capital is worth. A few days go by, and you decide to check on the stock's performance. You notice that the Nike stock price dropped from $65 to $61. So, your capital also dropped in value, from $6,500 to $6,100 to be exact. You lost $400, which is your capital loss. But you thought about this chapter and remembered that this is an unrealized capital loss because it is still parked in the stock market. You decide to wait it out, and after a few more days, the stock price increased back to $65, and you're happy that you're at break-even point. After a few days, it hit $72. You have just experienced your first unrealized capital gain and decide to share your Nike shares. You sell all your 100 shares at the current stock price of $72. So, you just received $7,200 in your cash account. Transfer fees not accounted for. By selling, you turned your unrealized gain into a realized capital gain. $7,200 minus $6,500 equals $700. You just made a quick $700 without doing any physical labor. Now, you still have to pay taxes on your capital gains depending on which type of investment account you are using and which income tax bracket you are in. This quick explanation is how many day and swing traders and even long-term investors make money. They analyze stock charts by looking at indicators and patterns to decide when to buy and sell stocks. You made a quick $700 with 100 Nike. But if you bought 1,000 shares, your profit would have been $7,000. If you have the money to spare, don't like taking any risk, and have idle time on your hands, you can make a pretty penny quickly by investing in the very risky penny stocks out there. Dividends. The second most common method investors make money is with dividends they received from dividend-paying stocks. Let's stick with the Nike stock example. So you bought 100 shares at $65, but instead of selling for a capital gain, you decided to hold on to those stocks for one year. Nike has made four dividend payments of $0.18 cents per share for the year. With your 100 shares, you received $18 for every single quarter, or $72 total. The great thing about dividends is that these payments get deposited into your cash account, or you can also reinvest them to buy more whole or fractional shares. These whole or fractional shares also end up paying you dividends. There are also disadvantages to dividends. 
the money you receive from dividends is mostly a lot lower than you would receive from a capital gain. Dividends are also a long-term strategy. They are not get-rich-quick. Also, many companies are flaky with their dividend payments. Some constantly cut their dividend payments and others completely halt paying dividends during times of financial hardship. There are also companies that never increase their dividend payments or increase it after years of paying the same dividend amount. However, I like dividend paying stocks, but only from specific companies. I do fundamental research to see which companies are worth buying, and I also analyze the dividend payment history, especially during times of economic turmoil. Because companies that can still pay an increase in dividend during a stock market crash are companies to keep an eye on. Let's look at five dividend paying stocks you should have on your watch list. Number one, Nike. This athletic apparel retailer sells its products worldwide with a focus specifically on athletes. However, the brand is still so immensely popular that even non-athletic types also wear Nike apparel. The biggest money makers are their footwear products with their flagship Jordan brand always selling like hotcakes. Number two, the Pepsi company. Many consumers think that the Pepsi company only owns the beverage, but they also own popular brands such as Frito-Lay and Quaker Foods. The Pepsi company has done a great job diversifying their portfolio of brands with high-quality consumer goods. Number three, Coca-Cola. This company, which is one of the most recognized brands worldwide, owns many additional brands besides the iconic Coke brand, like Minute Maid, Vitamin Water, and Powerade. Number four, Realty Income. This real estate investment trust, REIT, has tenants such as Walgreens, FedEx, and LA Fitness. They operate nationwide and are also diversified across many different industries. They also pay a monthly dividend, which makes them a favorite dividend company for many investors. Number five, Fastenal. This fairly boring company sells industrial and construction supplies. Even though Fastenal is not in an exciting industry as technology, it makes up for it by its sheer consistency in delivering value to both its customers and shareholders. Chapter 6. Dividends. Invest for Passive Income. If you want to invest for passive income, look no further than dividend-paying stocks. We'll talk about what dividends are, why companies give them out to shareholders, and the pros and cons. At the end, I'll give you four great dividend stocks to put on your watch list. Dividends are a great way to earn consistent income. Companies pay out dividends to their shareholders on a quarterly basis, but there are also companies that pay out monthly, semi-annually, and annually dividends. When you receive a dividend, it is either deposited in your cash account or it is reinvested to buy more whole or fractional shares. This is also called a dividend reinvestment plan, or DRIP. The ultimate goal of a dividend strategy is to receive dividend payments that meet or exceed your earned income. It is at this moment that you can retire and live off dividend income without ever having to sell the underlying stocks. It is also important that these dividend payments grow faster than inflation in order to maintain your buying power. Do you need $1 million to start investing in dividend-paying stocks? Of course not. You can start off by just buying one or two shares in dividend-paying companies. However, it will help if you have more money to invest because you'll get more in dividend income. The more shares you own, the more dividends come your way. For example, the Coca-Cola company pays out a $0.37 cents quarterly dividend, which adds up to $1.48 a year. That's what you would receive if you only owned one Coke share. But if you owned 100 shares, you would receive $148 for the year. In order to see your dividends make an impact, there are three things to take into account. Number one is, of course, buying dividend stocks on a consistent basis. Number two, the dividends you receive need to be reinvested or used to buy other shares that pay dividends. And number three, the companies you invest in need to grow their dividends faster than inflation 
on a yearly basis. These three factors will snowball your dividend income. Companies that pay dividends are usually blue chip companies. These are well established and large companies. They are the top companies in their industry. Companies like Walmart, 3M, and Procter and Gamble. Because these companies are well established, they tend not to experience a ton of growth, like a successful startup company. Many of these blue chip companies generate a ton of cash which they end up paying out as a dividend to their shareholders. Shareholders demand these dividends from companies as a repayment for investing and believing in the company. But leadership in the company also benefits from dividend payments because they get awarded stock shares and options. So let's say you have a successful local company selling ice cream and are planning to expand nationwide. You need more capital in order to achieve this. So you connect with investors who will invest in your company but they want ownership in the form of stock shares. Your company goes public, and after 15 years, you've been able to expand nationally. Your business is at a point where growth is slowing down. Your investors who held onto these shares want to receive some of their investment money back. So you decide to pay dividends to your investors so they can take their dividend income and invest it in a new business opportunity. Keep in mind that not all companies pay a dividend because every company goes through the business life cycle. A business first starts out as an idea in the mind of the creator. It is in this startup phase where it can be a small group of people working together, believing in the idea of the creator. It's also at this point where venture capitalists and angel investors could see the potential of the business. After working out all the kinks and learning from their mistakes, the company should have a customer base. It now can enter the growth phase. In this phase, there are still a lot of growing pains. This is also where a company might decide to go public and issue shares to potential shareholders. All the revenue a company generates is invested back into the business to further grow the company. Think about businesses like Snapchat. A company eventually hits the maturity stage where it is well established and a leader in its space. It's at this stage cycle where most companies start to pay dividends to their shareholders. Companies like Walmart, Clorox, ExxonMobil, and even Johnson & Johnson. Being a leader in your market is great, but if companies aren't careful, they can shift into the decline cycle where their products are becoming obsolete, like the Walkman or Polaroid pictures. Some of the pros of dividend investing? They are stable and consistent more so than capital gains. You benefit from the cash payment, and also from the increase in the share price of the stock. Because these companies are seen as more stable, they tend to perform better during the stock market crash because investors will sell their riskier stocks and look at more safe and stable companies and bonds to invest in. You can also plan out your dividend income, which is something that is harder to do with capital gains. A couple of cons of dividend investing are companies that pay out a dividend tend to appreciate slower in the stock market. Companies can also cut or even stop paying a dividend, and some companies don't even grow their dividends. It is therefore important to invest in great dividend-paying companies, which will not only pay a healthy dividend, but also have the financial capabilities to grow these dividends yearly. Let's look at four of these companies. Number one, Walmart. This retail giant has stores worldwide saving their customers money by providing products at competitive prices. Lately, they've been focusing much more on their online presence. They bought out Jet.com and a delivery company to improve their same-day delivery. Number two, Lowe's. The second biggest home improvement retailer, with of course Home Depot being number one, Lowe's has done such a good job in their field, they've been able to pay a consistently growing dividend over 50 years. Number three, McDonald's. The Golden Arches have been dragged through the mud, especially with the younger generation focusing more on healthier foods and snacks. However, McDonald's is still the number one fast food restaurant, and this giant pays a quarterly dividend. And number four, Fastenal. This boring company provides tools and equipment for businesses to create products, build and maintain facilities, and they also sell safety products for personnel. Fastenal not only has a great business, 
they also have repeat customers. Nothing is more important for a company than having customers that constantly return to buy your products. Chapter 7 90% of investors make these five mistakes. Making a mistake will make you scratch your head and think about what you've done wrong, but making additional mistakes will surely make you want to quit. I want to prevent this from happening by letting you know what the five common mistakes are that investors make so you won't fall for them. Number one, the so-called financial or stock market gurus. These are the so-called personalities who tell you what to buy and when to sell. They might also end up screaming their predictions. You should always be cautious when someone is giving you investing advice. Sometimes there are financial incentives that come into play in advising you what to buy. Always question the information you receive and that your guru has those investments he or she is pitching to you in their own portfolio. Gurus know how to tap into people's fears and emotions in order to get them to take action. Following the herd is also very risky. Instead of following a guru, you're following along everybody else. So if there are family members or even colleagues at work who will tell you what to buy and sell, you listen to them without even doing your own research first. This is very dangerous, and this is how people lose their money, by listening to hot tips. You don't want to follow the herd. They're easily influenced, and they act on emotions only when it comes to investing in the stock market. The herd is not logical, whatsoever, and they only follow the latest trends, hoping to get rich quick. Number two, not being patient and expecting wealth immediately. It goes without saying, that people invest in the stock market in order to get rich, save for retirement, or maintain the wealth they have accumulated. Being impatient and expecting results too soon will leave you disappointed and open to make mistakes. Every one of us has heard stories about investors making millions out of small investments. Most of these stories are anomalies because the vast majority of investors have to invest for the long term in order to see significant gains in their investments. Of course, it is possible to make a ton of money fast, but that is also very risky. The higher the risk in your investment, the higher the potential reward could be, but it could also be your downfall. Number three, not enjoying the investing process. You don't need to be passionate about investing in order to make it work in your favor, but you need to have some interest in investing. If the thought of doing your due diligence to decide which companies to invest in does not spark your interest, then it is best to invest passively, which is investing in mutual funds, ETFs, or index funds. There is absolutely nothing wrong with being a passive investor, and it's also recommended for beginning investors. That's how I started, by investing in mutual funds, bonds, and index funds. I quickly learned that investing was not too hard and I thought it was kind of interesting. I then switched from being a passive investor to being an active one, researching individual companies I want to invest in, buying them when they are undervalued, and making sure my asset allocation is up to date. Number four, giving up too early on the market. Many of us have had a bad experience with the market or know someone who has. Stock market crashes occur far too frequently, leaving investors disappointed frustrated, and stressed out. Many investors also get scammed into vesting in shady companies, which end up crashing on the stock market. Like my dad, who got contacted by an investment firm to invest in this particular mutual fund poised for growth. He ended up losing all his money and swore never to invest again. Luckily, I've been able to show him the error of his ways, and he has become an avid investor. I actually need to slow him down from not buying too many stocks, especially when they are overvalued. If you're ready to give up, don't. Try to figure out what you did wrong and ask for help if you need to. The stock market is still one of the best ways to build wealth. Number five, jumping in with no goals. Goals are your roadmap to success. Without a map, you will never be able to reach your destination. Imagine traveling from Kansas to New York without a map. 
you will have a much more pleasant travel experience with your map in your reach. This also applies to investing. You need to have a goal. Are you planning on day trading for a living? Or do you want to invest in penny stocks? Maybe your investing time horizon is only 10 years. These things will influence your investment strategy. It's okay to start out and test the waters without a plan in the beginning, but you quickly find out that you need a long-term goal which will have a major impact on your asset allocation. Chapter 8. Five Lies You've Been Told About Investing There are many lies people have been told about investing. Some of these lies are self-taught. People have been lied to because the person telling this lie doesn't know any better, or they failed themselves and don't want to see you fail. Other people have succeeded and don't want to see you accomplish your goals. So right now, we'll debunk five lies you've been told about investing. Number one, you need to be a millionaire or have a lot of money to start investing. This is not true at all in this day and age. Yes, in the past, the stock markets were only for the rich and wealthy, but the doors have been open to us common folks a long time ago. With the help of the internet, investing the stock market is a lot more accessible now. You can buy and sell shares from the comfort of your living room or bedroom. Discount brokers have also made it very affordable to buy and sell shares. Previously, you would have to pay hundreds of dollars just to buy or sell stocks. Now your commission fee can be as low as $4.99, even free if you're using an app like Robinhood. You also don't need thousands of dollars to buy shares. You can start off by just buying one share in a company like Coca-Cola, which has a share price of $46 right now. It's also better to start with a little bit of money compared to investing $1 million from the get-go. Reason for this is that with small amounts of money, you can experiment and have fun while you're learning the ins and outs of the market. Imagine your first time investing with $1 million. You would probably be too scared or cautious with the money, hoping not to lose a single penny in the market. Number two, I don't have enough or make enough money to start investing. Now, this one is a follow-up from the last lie. Any small amount of money you can set aside will help, even if it's only $10 a week. Those $10 add up to $520 by the end of the year, and you can definitely start investing with $520. Start saving for investing now, and your future self will thank you. Look at where you could save a couple of dollars during the week. It might mean eating out less during the week or one less trip to Starbucks a week. That is, if you like Starbucks, of course. A change of mindset will do wonders. Instead of saying, I don't have $10 to spare, change it to, how can I save $10 a week? You will kick your subconscious into high gear, and before you know it, you'll end up saving even more than just $10 a week. Number three. Invest now because long-term, the market has always seen a 7% return. Number three is a tricky one. You will hear financial advisors and even people in the media say this one. The reason you have to be careful with this one is because the future is unpredictable. No one can predict what the market will do or return in a given year. If the market went up 10% last year, that does not mean it will go up another 10% in the future. On the flip side, however, staying on the sidelines because you don't know what the market will do is risky in itself. People usually talk about the long-term returns to ease your mind and get you into investing. If you stay on the sideline, not only will your money not grow, it actually loses its buying power because of yearly inflation. Number four, I don't invest because the stock market is too risky. This one follows up nicely with lie number three. Yes, if you don't have at least some basic knowledge about investing, then it will be too risky. But with the help of financial planners and advisors, there's no need to be scared. Also, many investors do at least some self-education by reading investing books and listening to some audiobooks. Keep in mind that there is risk involved with anything you do. If you don't want to invest and rather keep the money under your mattress, you are opening yourself up to burglars, house fires, or even your dog that might end up eating or shredding your money. If you think that leaving your money in the bank 
or your savings account is the way to go, think again. With the measly 1% or less in interest that you'll earn, your money's buying power is being eaten away by inflation. If on average inflation is 3% per year, $1 today is worth 3% less next year, so 97 cents. Number five, you need to be an expert to start investing. It is true that you need to have some basic knowledge about how the stock market works, but you don't need to be Warren Buffett in order to get started. Get yourself educated by reading books. This one is a great start. Once you have built up your confidence, you can start by investing a small amount of money, money you would not mind losing. By investing a little amount, you psychologically prepare yourself for growth because once you see your investments growing, it will build up your confidence and knowledge to invest more, in a reasonable manner, of course. I hope I've been able to motivate you by debunking some of the most common lies that I often hear being told to eager investors. Chapter 9. Residual Income Ideas Bonus Chapter Let's look at three methods to make residual income, which will skyrocket you to financial freedom. If you are dying to quit your job, live the life you deserve, or just simply want to have more freedom to do what you want, then you will like this chapter. Residual income is income you generate passively. So, the money continues to come your way, no matter if you're not working or even sleeping. I'm not going to lie to you and say that it's easy to get a residual income stream set up, but it is worth it. Because once you have this residual income stream set up, you only need to passively maintain it. Online Businesses The first method of making residual income is by running an online business. This can be making money from ads while you're blogging or making money from your YouTube channel. You can also set up your own e-commerce site or sell other companies' products and get a commission, which is also called affiliate marketing. Another popular way of making residual income is from receiving royalty checks by selling physical books, ebooks, music, or photos. Even though you can make money with these ideas, there is a ton of competition because online businesses are very popular and people underestimate how hard it actually is to make a decent amount of money from these ideas. With all the competition, it also means that the online markets are flooded with mediocre products and services. So even if you come on the scene with the best product on the market, you won't stand out. This is when you have to think about how you want to advertise your products or services to rise above all the other mediocre products and become the leader in your field. Let me emphasize that having a product or service alone is just half the work. You also need to get visibility by advertising, whether this is social media marketing, PPC marketing, or word of mouth marketing is up to you. It's always good to do some competitive analysis and see how your competition is promoting their products. Another problem with online businesses is longevity. Many of these businesses can be here today and gone tomorrow because the competition just pushed you out of the market. Your products or services become obsolete or you cannot keep up with the technological or advertising changes, not allowing you to get all the necessary exposure to stay relevant. So it's not set it and forget it, it's set it and maintain it. Anything that is not considered passive, I left out of the list. So freelancing and consultancy only works while you are physically present. If not, you won't get paid. This defeats the purpose of making residual income. Real estate. The second way to make residual income is through real estate. I'm not talking about flipping houses because that takes too much work to buy and sell. It's also not passive. The focus should be on income properties which produce cash flow, meaning that after all expenses are accounted for, you come out with a net profit. Your tenants are paying you rent monthly. With these rent payments, you pay down the mortgage, if any, home insurance, taxes, capital expenditures, etc. If you buy in the right location, hire the right property manager, and run your numbers, you can have a nice stable income. You won't break the bank by just buying one property starting out, and the more properties you buy and take a mortgage on will increase your debt amount. This accumulation of debt will also hinder your process of getting approved for additional loans. 
This is when you have to get creative with financing your purchases. Private lenders or portfolio lenders could be two options to try out. The rent payments allow you to generate residual income, and the more properties you own, the higher your residual income could potentially be. There are also many tax benefits associated with doing real estate. This is not a method of making a ton of residual income fast, but it is stable and grows nicely with each additional property. Many millionaires owe their riches to real estate, also giving them the flexibility and freedom to travel and be their own boss. A great way to start is to buy single-family homes, duplexes, triplexes, or quads. These are considerably cheaper than commercial real estate or apartment complexes. You can start with residential real estate or try your hands at franchising and commercial real estate once you have the skills and money saved up. Dividend Paying Stocks The third method, and if you have been paying attention to my book, you know what it is. Making Residual Income Through Dividend Paying Stocks There are a group of companies that pay some of their net income out as a dividend to shareholders. Not all of these companies are worth investing in, though. So analyzing a company's performance is highly recommended. The beauty about investing for dividends is that you are creating a nice stream of residual income that should grow faster than inflation. Companies increase their dividend payments, and by constantly buying the right dividend stocks and reinvesting those dividends to buy whole or partial shares, you supercharge your dividend income. Just keep in mind that you will have to pay taxes on your dividend income depending on the type of investment account you're using. It's also very easy to start because you don't need to have a ton of money. You can start by just buying one share of a dividend-paying company. Many of the wealthiest individuals on earth have dividend-paying companies in their portfolio. Guys like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and even Bill Gates. Now, the last two methods of making residual income, real estate and investing, I call those old money because they have been the pillars of generating and maintaining wealth. Online businesses, however, can be tricky. One month you could be making a lot of money, but the next month could be the total opposite. If you want to play it smart and safe, you should diversify your income streams so you have money coming in from different sources. Conclusion As a beginner, investing in the stock market can be quite daunting, so don't get hung up if you feel like you are lost, I've been there, and many successful investors also felt this way when they bought their first shares. Once you take that leap of faith, it will get easier. It is also best to start investing with a small amount of money and monitor your results. This will give you the confidence and motivation to move forward. Once you have some experience under your belt, you can start taking calculated risk. As always, you do need to constantly educate yourself. Otherwise, you will make mistakes. But just the simple fact that you have made it this far tells me that you are willing to do what is necessary to improve your financial future. You have what it takes to become successful and take charge of your future with confidence. Thank you. I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming along with me on this investing journey. There are many investing books out there but you decided to give this one a chance. If you like this book, then I need your help. Please take a moment to leave an honest review for this book. This feedback gives me a good understanding of the kinds of books and topics readers want to read about, and it will also give my book more visibility. Leaving a review takes less than one minute and is much appreciated. Other titles by Giovanni Richters. 50 Tips on Saving Money. Ever have a feeling that you never have enough money when needed? Would you like to have some extra cash to buy what you feel like? Well, in this book, we will look at 50 different tips allowing you to have extra cash in your pocket and bank account. Smart investors create wealth. It's never too early to start your journey towards accumulating wealth. No one wants to work for the rest of their life. I will show you what wealthy people have known for centuries on how to not only create wealth, but also maintain it so you can pass it down. Stock Market Investing for Beginners and Dummies Author, Giovanni Ritkers Narrator, Ron Garner Print Copyright, Year 
2018 by Giovanni Ritkers. Production, copyright, 2019 by Giovanni Ritkers.